Welcome to the Education Magazine, and we haven't been with you for some time, but we're back, and we're back for 2021 and a new series, and we're kicking off with the new changes that have been happening in Wales, or at least about to happen in Wales. It's been a long time coming, and if you've got um, if you've got a pen and paper, write it down because it's going to be a long title. This, the Additional Learning Needs Education Tribunal Wales Act 2018. That is a mouthful, um, but we're going to be talking about that today in today's presentation, which is going to be joined uh, by a number of other speakers, not just myself. I'm just going to introduce you, and we'll be joined by uh, our wonderful Charlotte Hadfield, who you've met, I'm sure, in Series 1, uh, and Chris McFarlane. So uh, welcome to both Charlotte and Chris. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Hi. The presentation might take a bit of time. In fact, it might go on for about an hour or two, and it, you will have the option to watch segments of today's presentation. It's slightly different to the normal education magazine format because it's going to be more like a seminar, and we're going to invite you to ask some questions, and we're going to go through some of those questions and answers um, to try and resolve uh, a lot of the problems that I know that have been coming through uh, on Facebook and in questions that we've been asked in emails through to the office here. So what has changed? Well, a lot. Um, it's, as I say, it's been a long time coming in England. We've been long able to appeal the contents of an education healthcare plan and before that, uh, a statement even, um, following an annual review. And we've never been able to do that in Wales. So um, the, the Act is going to cover some ground there. So it's going to introduce a whole new uh, system uh, of um, dealing with the procedures that relate to identifying young people who might have additional learning needs and the preparation uh, of what uh, used to be the statement of special educational needs, now the individual development plan. And um, the presentation will go through today um, discussion about the key areas of change, which will be introduced by the legislation um, and the individual development plan itself, what we could expect in the run up to getting an individual development plan, uh, and how, if you feel you're not happy with it, how you can go about appealing the contents of that, of that plan to a special educational needs uh, tribunal in Wales. Some of you might be watching and thinking, well, this has nothing to do with me because I'm based in England or somewhere else. And why would I want to watch uh, a presentation which is exclusively in relation to Welsh legislation? Well, there may be some reasons for that, because what, not one of the primary reasons, I would say, is to it's useful to compare practices that are happening in different parts of the UK to understand how there could be changes introduced uh, in, in, in your area. Um, and we've learned a lot in um, following the passage of the Children and Families Act 2014 in England. Uh, and there have been some problems with that. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will be quite familiar with those kind of difficulties that are often experienced. And again, in Wales, we've those who've been practicing in Wales and who are living in Wales often look across the River Severn and think, well, is it better over there? Or is it better for us here in Wales? Well, I think uh, it's up until now, I think it's been probably better in England. Um, because the, the system that's in operation in England has enabled people to appeal to the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal um, at annual review phases. And key points include, of course, the fact that in England, long has there been an opportunity now for you to challenge through a tribunal the educational provision for a young person beyond the age of school. So when they're at college, because of course the legislation goes on until 25, whereas in Wales, uh, you have to be uh, holding at, uh, at the moment a statement of special educational needs up to the age uh, by the time you reach um, end of school age. Uh, and when you leave school, the statement of special needs ceases. So, and then that the regime uh, historically went on to the learning and skills legislation, which was talking about the Welsh government, which would produce a learning uh, and skills plan, which would then be challenged through their own internal mechanisms rather than through the tribunal. So it's much more of a challenge when you're looking at trying to find support for young people who are who have left school in Wales and getting those 
those disputes heard by an independent and impartial tribunal service. So we now have this uh, new legislation in, in Wales, which will extend to the further education uh, sector and, uh, and, and onwards. So uh, it's going to be uh, quite a change, and we're all going to be, I'm sure, looking forward to it, anxious, I, I, I guess, but also uh, nervous about the kind of, uh, of uh, new domains that we will be entering, uh, and that no doubt will going to be uh, a, a time when us lawyers uh, will be working very hard to try and improve the lives of so many young people with special educational needs. So... I'm going to bring you now uh, on to Chris uh, McFarland, uh, and Chris is going to talk to you about the key definitions within the legislation. Um, those are the key definitions of what constitutes additional learning needs. So, Chris, thanks for joining us today, and um, over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so, yes, so as Mike explained there, uh, there's going to be a number of substantial changes to the law of special educational needs here in Wales. And in particular, it's phasing out the phrase special educational needs and special educational provision and replacing it with a new term uh, of additional learning needs and consequently additional learning provision. So in this section, we're going to talk about some of the key definitions. You know, a lot of words will be bandied about in this seminar, such as additional learning needs and also uh, individual development plans. Well, you know, what are they? You know, what do those mean? So we've got a few slides here to, to help uh, and that understanding. So the first one we've got here is the definition of additional learning needs, and this is at section two of the Act. So the definition is a person has additional learning needs if he or she has a learning difficulty or disability, whether the learning difficulty or disability arises from a medical condition or otherwise, which calls for additional learning provision. And then uh, what they go on to expand is then that a child of compulsory school age or person over that age has a learning difficulty or disability if he or she a has a significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of others the same age or b has a disability for the purposes of the equality act 2010 uh, and really you know that's very similar if not virtually identical to the tests that we have now uh, both in wales and in england so this is not so much a change in how we perceive those with special educational needs it's more of a rephrasing of that uh, to additional learning needs and the use of this new terminology uh, likewise moving on to uh, additional learning provision uh, which is section 3 of the act that is defined as uh, for a person age three or more means educational or training provision that is additional to or different from that may generally for others of the same age in mainstream maintained schools in Wales, mainstream institutions in further educational sector in Wales or places in Wales at which nursery education is provided. And then additional learning provision for those under three means educational provision of any kind. So what's useful here is the definition is very similar to that we see currently under the Education Act 1996. So again, they're not looking to move the goalposts here, looking to keep it relatively close to the current system. But there is a slight tweak here that currently, when we're looking at special educational provision here currently under the system, we're looking at that in the local area. So what is being applied in the local area? And that can mean that in very rare circumstances, you could have something that would be provision, perhaps in the Vale of Glamorgan, but perhaps not provision in Ronda Canon Taff. Now, those examples are extremely rare, but here now they're extending the definition to what would be applied generally in mainstream maintained schools in Wales. So it wouldn't really matter that variance between those local areas and local areas couldn't claim, well, we do a bit more of this naturally, so it wouldn't be provision here. Um, it would actually be a case that, well, if that's still across the whole of Wales, considered to be additional to or different from that that would be available at your mainstream, mainstream maintained mainstream schools, uh, then it would count as provision here. We saw a very similar, if not nearly identical, change during the Children and Families Act 2014 in England, and that has already um, been the subject of various cases and definitions there. So moving on to individual development plans. Well, what is an individual development plan? Well, it will replace the statement and it will be the new statutory document for those with special educational needs here in Wales. And we're looking here at the key definition, which is in section 10 of the ALN Act. And it says, for the purposes of this act, an individual development plan is a document that contains 
A, a description of the person's additional learning needs. B, a description of the additional learning provision which the person's learning difficulty or disability calls for. C, anything else required or authorised by or under this Act. And we will come on later to discuss that in more detail. And luckily here, one of the key differences and challenges, I think, with the changes in England with the Children and Families Act 2014 is the Act specified a lot of what was to be in uh, education and healthcare plans, as they're known over in England, uh, but it didn't actually give them a format. It just told them what was to be in it. And you ended up getting a, a kind of kaleidoscope of different approaches across uh, local authorities in England, each interpreting the education healthcare plan in their own way, uh, sometimes very well, sometimes very poorly, and everywhere in between. Uh, and it could be quite challenging for parents and even for us as practitioners to look at these various plans thinking, hang on, have we actually got uh, an education healthcare plan here? Is this some kind of non-statutory plan? I, I know of one um, education authority in England in particular that used to call their education healthcare plans my plan, uh, which was not helpful to anyone because no one knew what it was called. So here they've actually set out a format. It's in Annex A of the Code of Practice. So there will be a standardised form uh, for local authorities in Wales and schools and further educational colleges in Wales to complete. So it will keep things uniform, which will be helpful indeed. Uh, so, yes, just summarising then the key definition. So the term special educational needs has now been abolished and will be replaced with the term additional learning needs. Uh, additional learning provision is defined as provision that is additional to or different from that could be expected within a typical mainstream institution across Wales. And very similar to the existing definitions of SEN and special education provision that we've already talked about. It's not intended to change it except for the terminology used. And IDPs are to function similarly to statements, which we'll go on to uh, later in the conference, uh, but with differences in form, content and the body responsible to them. So, uh, so Mike, Charlotte, turning back to you uh, for a second, now we've talked about some of those key definitions. Uh, Mike, is there anything that sticks out to you, perhaps, uh, from those that you, you think needs to be highlighted at this stage? Well, I mean, I, I highlighted a lot, didn't I, Chris, about I didn't like the term additional learning needs back when it was first introduced. <laughs> I thought it was nicer and softer to refer to needs as being special educational needs, but we're, 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 we have to live with that term now. Um, the reason for that was that, you know, I, I think that to try and say that someone has a number of needs, but here you have some additional ones, is not as nice as to say that um, a child has special educational needs. There's something special about that child that um, uh, I, I preferred that term, frankly, but then we have to live with the term as it is. But I think there's a lot to, to, to applaud in relation to um, the idea, as you say, about in practical, from a practical perspective, we're now looking at what provision is available in Wales as the benchmark to decide whether or not someone could qualify for additional learning provision. And I think that's better because that will avoid um, local authorities having, as we've seen in England, having different strategies and processes to try and devolve to schools um, support that they will say, well, actually, we, uh, we, we've got more here uh, than maybe a neighbouring authority, and therefore you don't need an education healthcare plan. Whereas in, uh, I, I know that's not a lawful approach in England, because of course they should compare um, what's available in throughout England, not 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 just the local authority. But of course that was something that hasn't happened in in Wales until now, and we've got this introduction. So I think that's a good thing in in, in practical in, from a practical perspective. I mean, Charlotte, do you agree with that? I think I do. Um, I, I I definitely agree that a national comparison is better because it removes it removes sort of unevenness of provision across um, from, from local authority to local authority. And it kind of forces local authorities to, 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 to sort of aspire upwards in terms of provision rather than downwards. You don't have a situation where a local authority can kind of set the bar for when you get additional learning provision based on what it itself provide, provides, which always seemed like a bit, a bit of an oddity to me under the Education Act. Um, the only other thing that I... Um, the only other thing that I noticed is that it's made clear in this act, unlike in the sort of corresponding English legislation, it's made clear that um, a, a disability has to be a disability that is a qualifying disability under the Equality Act. I mean, you know, there's a slight question mark over whether that you, you, the, the English legislation doesn't say that slight question mark over whether you could have a disability that didn't qualify under the Equality Act. But they have clarified that in this legislation. 
Um, and I agree with you, Mike, I am a little bit, I don't know, I'm a little bit disappointed by kind of the proliferation of acronyms. You know, I'm not sure that we need another term for special educational needs. Um, and I agree with you that additional learning needs isn't, isn't really a sort of um, inclusive a term, I guess I would say. Well, that was my thought, um, because, I mean, I have a, a child with special educational needs, and um, I used to always say how special um, he was. Um, and I think it's a softer phrase, but we have to live with it, don't we? I mean, Chris, <laughs> you know it as well in your own personal experience. Yeah, that's right. You know, obviously, I'm growing up with my sister having special educational needs. You know, I think that, um, you know, as you say, that that word special, they are special people, of course, but it, it, you'd like to think it was softer. I think they tried to go to a more neutral term, perhaps a more clinical term. Um, and I think that, you know, I think there's pros and cons to that. I think, you know, the pro to that is, I suppose, it's less likely, I suppose, to be used as any kind of derogatory tone. You know, we know kids can be cruel. Um, but of course, I suppose it does take away from the positive, which, of course, as you say, Mike, you know, you it, these children were special and and rightfully it was nice that the term was that and, and again Charlotte I definitely agree with you though that the alphabet soup of acronyms of ALN, SEN, SEP, ALP you know it's hard enough for parents um, and teachers you know and especially with their heightened role in this legislation to be dealing with so many different terms and for people perhaps to speak across purposes. Um, so yeah, I think there may have been a lack of wisdom. I am going to hi highlight actually with the IDPs, um, we're gonna talk about these in a bit, bit of detail later, but I just wanted to highlight this because it is part of the definition, which, uh, well, since we're all lawyers here, we'll, we'll point out as a bit of a spoiler alert, but I don't know if you both picked up on that, um, it doesn't say that the plan specifies these descriptions, just as it contains. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if that was a selective choice of drafting in comparison to what we see in the Education Act and in the Children and Families Act, where it says it is a plan specifying X, Y, and Z, whereas here it contains. And of course, we all know that the specification of plans is extremely important. And much of the case law surrounding that specification has very much turned on the fact that the Act itself used that term. So do you think that there might have been a, a, a sneaky softening there of the requirements uh, in relation to IDPs? I think that's for the next part of the presentation, Chris. <laughs> Jumping ahead. <laughs> Let's not give anything away. <laughs> well, that's a, stay tuned to, to find I mean, out I, the answer I mean, I suppose, to that and more questions. I suppose um, one can um, perhaps think, I mean, when, when, when this legislation was first being proposed, um, we all were swinging our arms about, some of which some of us were delighted and others were a bit disturbed that um, that um, many young people um, will uh, either get or not get, of course, the plan based on the description of what constitutes special educational additional learning needs. I should like using the phrase myself, <laughs> additional learning needs. Uh, and, um, and the link between the definition and the provision when it comes to qualifying for a plan. So um, if you have a, um, a, a school system, an education system throughout Wales, which is under-resourced, one would think that everyone will be getting <laughs> the, um, a, an individual development plan because the under-resourced is going to require additional um, support than that which would ordinarily um, be available if you've got special education, additional learning needs and you require additional support, it's going to be additional too, because of course the schools are under-resourced anyway, but that's another story for <laughs> politics perhaps. <laughs> yes, we, um, we are, um, it's probably the good point to come on to the next part of the presentation really, which is going to deal with the duty um, to decide. The, the duty to decide. And that's the critical point. So, um, and Charlotte, of course, will be talking later about the, the plan itself and what should go into it. And we'll go on to the question about specificity then. Um, so, Chris, over to you on the du duty to decide. Thank you very much. So, yes, the duty to decide. So we'll take you through our slides again. That should help, you know, keep things uh, clear in your mind. And obviously we will put uh, these slides available on our website if you'd like to have a look at them at a later stage. So looking through the duty to decide. So what is the duty to decide? So the duty to decide will apply to maintain schools, uh, further educational colleges um, and the local authority. And there are different sections applying to those bodies uh, which are specified. So section 11 for maintain schools and 
through their educational colleges and the local authority under section 12 broadly replaces uh, the statutory assessment process that we currently have under the education act 1996 so when does the duty apply so the duty applies when it is brought to the attention of or otherwise appears to these bodies that a child or young person in wales may have additional learning needs unless the child or young person already has an idp individual development plan uh, the body previously made a decision whether the child or young person has ALN and their needs have not changed materially since the decision and there is no new information that materially affects that decision. Uh, in the case of a young person, the young person does not consent to that decision being made and we will see as a consistent theme throughout this Act that they have tried to give young people a more direct voice as to whether or not they should be subject to these procedures and I think we'll come on later to discuss whether that might be a positive and a negative and I think it could very well be both in these circumstances and then the other reason is a local authority in England maintains an EHC plan for the child or young person so how does it come to the attention of these bodies and we are talking about any of these bodies so if a child is at a maintained school uh, then of course it could be brought to the attention of the school FE college the same and the local authority the same well it could be anyone they really don't seem to put a restriction on who can bring this to the attention so it could be a child or young person themselves their parents or family members or professional body uh, may bring this matter to the attention of the body concerned and that will then trigger that uh, requirement to decide whether the young person has additional learning needs or not so it's quite good in the sense that previously we would have the request for an assessment and they could decide whether or not to agree to an assessment you'd have six weeks to do that so you wait around six weeks for them to decide whether they're even going to really bother assessing the child's needs well that step's really gone away with here um you know that where it's brought to the the attention of these bodies you know they must make a decision whether or not they have uh, additional learning needs they are required to do so and that will require some investigation and we'll come on in a bit to talk about what that will be um, but it's quite good that you will get a definitive yes or no and as we'll come on to later there may be rights of reconsideration or rights of appeal that may flow from that so it is good that you will get a decision you won't be knocked out at the preliminary stage which you might be in England and which you might be under the current system so I think that is a positive change the removal of that step now, moving on to the next slide, as you can see, there's quite a lot of dense material here. So we'll try and summarise it as best we can. OK, so what investigations must be made? So paragraph 22 of the Code of Practice confirms investigations which identify whether the child or young person may have ALN and the subsequent decision as to whether the person has ALN requires evidence. Uh, the evidence might come from staff within the school or FE college or other educational setting or other services which have been involved with the child or young person. It might also come from the child, their parents, or the young person themselves. So it's not really limiting the sources of that evidence, just saying that that evidence is required. 24, uh, 20.4, I should say, uh, confirms that the following sources, among others, may be consulted and provides quite a, diff a comprehensive list. But again, that list is not exhaustive. So if you have information or evidence that you feel is relevant that's not in that list, you certainly can and should give that to the relevant body. And then for maintained schools or an FE colleges, there's no actual requirement under the law for them to consult or even to consider to consult a particular expert, let's say an educational psychologist. So again, this is a slight distinction from the current system we have with a statutory assessment where an educational psychologist must be involved in that assessment. Um, when it comes to local authorities, uh, they must consider whether to seek advice from an educational psychologist and if it considers it necessary to do so, then it must obtain it. So a slight weakening you could see there, certainly at a local authority level, as to the requirement to involve an educational psychologist. However, whether or not that in practice actually leads to um, less frequent instruction of educational psychologists remains to be seen. And of course, that does not prohibit parents from requesting uh, such an assessment if they feel it's necessary and forcing the local authority to really explain themselves if they feel that that decision um, has not been made. So 
One thing we would say as well, the code does emphasise that even in cases such as at the institutional level, so at the college or the mainstream school level, just because they're not required to instruct an educational psychologist to assess does not mean that one isn't required or should be instructed in that case. So that's what they're trying to emphasise is just because you don't have a legal duty to do it doesn't mean it isn't right and should be done in this case. Uh, so that's clear guidance to those institutions that, you know, you shouldn't feel that there's any kind of prohibition on that type of assessment or it wouldn't be useful. So it's a very important thing to remember. And what are the timeframes for this decision? So I think this is very helpful as well because it shortens the timeframes that, that currently exist. So when we talk about timeframes, certainly in England, uh, we're looking at from the date you request an EHC assessment, so the start of the EHC process, to the finalisation of the plan is 20 weeks. That's the the regulatory timeframes that the local authorities have to comply with all those steps. That's uh, agreeing to assess, conducting the assessment, deciding on whether or not to issue a plan, and then preparing that plan. Well, things have been shortened quite considerably here in Wales when it comes to the decision as to whether or not a child or young person has ALN. Uh, it's 35 school or term days at the mainstream or college level, so essentially seven weeks. Uh, but obviously any days off, any inset days wouldn't count towards that, any school holidays wouldn't count towards that. Um, and then for local authorities, the time frame is 12 weeks for a direct request. But if it's reconsidering a decision of a mainstream school, uh, then it's seven weeks. So even adding those you know, times together, you're looking at realistically 14 weeks is the, the long, longest period, because that would be a request being made to a school, uh, a mainstream school then Refuse it, refusing to find that the child has ALN or perhaps not giving a good enough uh, plan. And then reconsideration going up to the local authority after that seven week period would be a further seven weeks. So except for when there's perhaps the summer holiday period where you'll have that six week break at the school level, and then you would still be open to make your request direct to the local authority. It is a much shorter process and intended to be a much shorter process than that in England. Um, so that's helpful because we find that many of our clients are usually satisfied when they get a plan or a statement, but that can really take a very, very long time. You know, 20 weeks is, you know, the best part of six months and often there are delays in those processes. So having a shorter time period will hopefully mean uh, the decisions Chris, are made. Chris, I just thought I'd raise one point, but what about the time limit within which to draft the plan? Well, we're coming on to that, Mike. You're you're falling victim to uh, to ah. my um, to to my error earlier because of the next section that Charlotte will be dealing with will be the plan, and we'll talk about those timeframes. But spoiler alert: they are the same time frame. There you go. So, oh, Charlotte's going to have nothing to say. I know <laughs> it's 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 unbelievable. So yes, so I mean that's nice and simple, really. The duty to decide. So, Mike, I mean you have been practicing as an education lawyer in Wales for a, a very long time. Uh, what do you think about this new duty to decide? And it's pros and cons, I suppose, when we compare it to the statutory assessment process we currently have. Well, um, as always, one has to be controversial. Um, I've always taken the view, and I've never shied from this view, that um, one of the benefits of the old system, which remains in England, but uh, to, to a degree exists in Wales under the new legislation, was the separation between the questions raised by the family, the requests made by the family, and the decision maker being, in most cases, the um, local authority, as it was. And now the decision um, in practice, I think, going to be more often than not made by the school. And the reason why I always expressed concern about that was because that is a gr there is a greater likelihood of fueling dispute between parents and schools on a practical level, which, in my opinion, should never have been attempted because the relationship between a parent and a school is of critical importance for the benefit of the child. So the first point I'd say from a practical perspective is that 
decisions, I guess, in practice are going to be more often than not made initially by the school, and that will decide whether uh, the um, th there is an existence of trust between the parents and the school and whether or not that's going to be preserved. So I, I, I was concerned about that. I don't think anything in the legislation has appeased my concern. Only time will tell. I'm not sure whether Chris or Charlotte, you agree with that, but that was the concern that I had in terms of the everyday practice of this. Well, I'll, uh, I'll bring Charlotte in here. So Charlotte, what, what, do, you, what do you think about, uh, about the duty to decide? I think broadly I agree with Mike. I don't I don't I, 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 I don't know how far so so coming from the sort of English perspective, if you like, and looking at the Children and Families Act, I, I don't know how far there is really a qualitative difference in the exercise that you're going to conduct. Um I talk in my section about the 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 sort of difference in terms of what happens, you know, the you know, the the the, the um the end of school action and school action plus, for example. But yeah, I think broadly I agree with Mike. Well, I then am going to be a little bit controversial myself, and I think I'm going to respectfully disagree with you both. But I accept that it's much to do with the execution, and that will really be the proof of the matter, because I think that the intention, and I accept that the execution may be very different. I think that's where you're both coming from, that, you know, in the cases we deal with, you know, if you can have a supportive school, that's that's really helpful. Um, and of course, you don't want the school to be the opponent um, wherever possible, because that means that even if you eventually succeed in the appeal, you know, perhaps the, the relationship has broken down to the point where the child's not going to go back anyway. So I think those are all valid points. However, I think it's crucial to remember that this system is designed to replace what is currently known as School Action or School Action Plus, which for those viewers at home who don't know what that means, that's school-based provision that's implemented directly by the school. And it's usually subject to school based amendment. Uh, it's essentially a way to access additional funding to support those pupils without the need to have a statement and will generally support pupils whose needs are under the current system, not severe enough to warrant a statement, uh, at least in the eyes of the local authority. So that school or institutional level IDP is to replace that system. And those pupils who perhaps are more complex, who require, you know, very different levels of provision, would then go up to the local authority. And I think the fact that it's it's a 35 day turnaround as well. I think that it's designed to get something in place quickly, get something enforceable in place quickly and and for the benefit of that child. So I think I'm going to take a slightly more hopeful view and hope that this means that for those schools, and there are many of them out there that are, you know, really helpful and supportive uh, you know, to their pupils with SEN. They really take that as a point of pride and really make it a, a centre point of, of their provision to all their pupils, which is great. You know, I think it will allow them to really establish some best practice. Um, although I think, Mike, you were, you were very good at emphasising, certainly when this is in the bill stage, that you know, poor teachers, they work hard enough already. And, and this bill does, or this act now, does put a lot more responsibility on them. So I think it remains to be seen whether you know, those timeframes and those responsibilities to decide are, are going to unfortunately stretch uh, a group of people uh, and a sector that is probably already quite stretched, particularly after this COVID year. So it remains to be seen. But uh, but Charlotte, you're in charge of the next section of our presentation, and you're going to talk us through the individual development plan. Yes, I am. OK, so part five of our talk is uh, in relation to individual development plans, which will be the Welsh equivalent of the um, education, health and care plan that we see across the border. So um, moving to uh, side 15.5.1, what is uh, the uh, individual development plan? Well, um, if the child's maintained school or the young person's further education college decides that a child or young person has additional learning needs, it must prepare and maintain an, ind an individual development plan for them, an IDP. And it must do this unless uh, one of the exceptions in section 12.2 of the ALN Act apply. And those are firstly, that the governing body considers that the child or young person has additional learning needs that may call for ALP, it would not be reasonable for the governing body to secure. So the first exception to the rule that it's the school or college that, um, that must prepare and maintain an IDP is 
if the ALP that's in the IDP is 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 such that you wouldn't expect a school to secure it as opposed to a local authority. So it's obviously difficult to know anecdotally, it's obviously difficult to know at this stage how that's going to be viewed, but typical examples would be things like full-time one-to-one TA support, which tends to be the source of cost that you would expect a local authority to um, fund and not the governing body of a school. Um, Therapeutic provision over and above what that school may have attached to it anyway. Um, that, That sort of provision is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, And uh, secondly, um, if the governing body cannot adequately determine what the extent um, of the ALP required would be um, or or cannot adequately determine what the what what the needs would be. Um, And in that circumstance, the governing body can refer the case to the local authority that is responsible for the local authority to make um, the decision. So. It's interesting because under the new regime, if you have ALN, you will get an IDP as a child or as a a young person. Um, And that's different from the current situation, of course, which is that we have some children with um, special educational needs who will be on School Action or School Action Plus and who will get their special educational provision directly from the governing body and others who have statements and will get their um, special educational provision from the local authority. So I quite like that. And we'll, we'll talk about at the end of the session how, how Mike and Chris feel about that. But I quite like that. I think it's nice that we now have a situation where there aren't going to be particular tiers of, um, of, of mechanisms for provision. If you have um, additional learning needs, you will get an IDP. And the difference will be in who is responsible for preparing and maintaining it. And that will depend on the severity of the needs and the extent of the special uh, special educational provision. We're not saying that anymore. The additional learning provision that the child or young person will need. Um, Other exceptions to um, the principle that the maintained school or FE college must prepare and maintain the IDP are um, if the governing body requests a local authority in England to secure an assessment Um, under the Children and Families Act. Um, So in some situations, you have a young person or a child who is being educated in Wales, but their um, responsibility for them lies with a local authority in England, um, or if a local authority in England already maintains an EHC plan for the child or young person. Uh, There is another important um, distinction, which I don't think is expressly in either the Education Act or in the equivalent English legislation, which is that if the plan is about a young person, the young person has to consent to the plan being prepared or maintained. And if they don't, then the plan cannot be prepared and maintained, however much everybody might think that young person needs provision. Interesting questions about capacity there, maybe, that we can come back to. So moving on to point 5.2. If the local authority decides that a child or young person has ALN, it must prepare and maintain an IDP for the child or young person. Or if the child or young person is or is going to be a registered pupil at a maintained school in Wales and the local authority considers it appropriate, they can either prepare an IDP but direct the governing body to maintain it. That might be interesting later on or direct the governing body of the school to prepare and maintain a plan. Um, And again, that is the case unless the decision relates to a young person who doesn't consent to an IDP being prepared or maintained, in which case the local authority can't do do that either. Uh, Going on to point 5.3, what what, what should be in an IDP? Well, again, we have, (laughs) um, you know, uh, under the Education Act, we have parts, Under the Children and Families Act in England, we have sections. Under this Act, we have parts and we have sections. So um, part one, section 1A will contain basic biographical information about the child or young person and contact details. Section 1B will set out who is responsible for the IDP. So it will identify who is is maintaining it. Is that um, a school? Is that the local authority and when will it next be reviewed? And section 1C will contain um, the personal profile. So in other words, the all about me section that we see. Uh, Part two, section 2A will will um, will effectively be um, old, old part two. So a description of the child or young person's additional learning needs. And again, we'll come back to that interesting thing, description as opposed to specification. Section 2P, description and delivery 
of the child or young person's additional learning provision. Section 2C, description and delivery of ALP to be secured by an NHS body. I think that's going to be interesting given the way that the Welsh healthcare system works, but I'm also going to defer later to Chris to talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, and section 2D, placement at the name school, other institution or board and lodging, which um, again is a nice additional clarification that has sometimes caused problems across the border in terms of what if you've got something that is arguably not a school and may not qualify as another institution. Um, particularly useful, I think, for young people who may be getting provision that consists of, uh, that, that is delivered partly in a residential setting such as supported living accommodation and partly in an FE college. Um, in part three, you'll have a record of it. 3A will be the record of information used to develop the IDP. So that's where you will summarise the reports that have informed the content of the IDP. Section 3B will contain a timeline of key events. Section 3C will deal with any transition issues. And Section 3D will deal with travel arrangements. Um, going to 5.4, what about enforceability and review? So uh, the app says that a maintained school, FE college or local authority that maintains an IDP must secure the ALP that is described in the IDP. So that, again, is a mandatory obligation. And I am suspecting that we're going to see an authority uh, fairly soon afterwards to the effect that that is non-delegable in the same way as um, duties are non-delegable now. So in other words, if a school or a local authority or an FE college is the person that is maintaining um, the plan and delivering the provision within it, they're not going to be able to defend any um, arguments about non-provision by saying, oh, well, we, we delegated it to somebody else to do and that body didn't do it. Um, in terms of annual review, um, again, it's um, annual review within 12 months of the date that the initial IDP was sent to the child, young person or their parents. So it can be within any time during that first 12 months, but it, must, it mustn't be further than 12 months away from the date of the creation or um, 12 months from the outcome of the previous review, um, the date when that was sent to the child, young person or their parents. And it's important just to bear in mind that as with the Children and Families Act now, um, a successful tribunal outcome does not reset the review programme. So you could, in principle, have a situation where you get your successful tribunal outcome. And three weeks later, there has to be an annual review because of this timetable. Although obviously you would expect in that situation that the local authority or the school would not be messing about with the provision that the tribunal had ordered. OK, so that takes us to the end of part five. Um, so, sorry, Charlotte, sorry. Um, thank you. I was going to say some, some, some very interesting points that emerge there, aren't there? Mm, mm, very much so. I mean, I, I, I like the points that you made about the introduction of a, a child that, um, for the first time, who could refuse yeah. uh, the, 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 the plan. Um, I mean, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Um, when asked oneself, I do often, would I be here today uh, talking as a solicitor if I did um, today what I wanted to do when I was 12? Um, and, you know, one wonders that giving children a voice is critically important. Of course it's important, but sometimes children make the wrong decisions. Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I think it's not it's not terribly clear, but I think it's going to be the case that up until 16, parents will continue to be able to make the decision. I think the problem is going to be going to come when you have young people. Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, in practice, are there going to be that many young people who are going to refuse to consent to an IDP? There will almost certainly be some, but but whether there will be droves and droves of them is a genuine, you know, is, is genuinely up in the air because I think most young people who have additional learning needs um, are quite motivated to seek help for them, provided it's offered in a way that is acceptable to them. Well, maybe I could throw in pathological demand avoidance syndrome. True. Yes. <laughs> Yes, there are definitely going to be some young people who will find the idea of an IDP unacceptable, almost because it might help them. We know that, unfortunately, some young people will, will just really struggle to accept that help. Um, and, and the difficulty, of course, Mike, is that some of those you can't you certainly cannot assume that a young person who's got PDA or ODD won't have capacity to make that decision, because, as we know, a, a bad capacitist decision is still a capacitist decision. Mm. Yeah. 
I think I think that uh, so just to confirm, it is in the interpretation uh, of the act, the section of the act, that a young person means a person over compulsory school age but under twenty five, which I think is interesting because normally they do define it as sixteen, which obviously would generally be relevant in terms of compulsory school age. But it does mean that if compulsory school age were to move up to eighteen or or beyond, yeah. then that would automatically shift with it, which is an interesting uh, point of drafting. But yes, the act, I will say, and there are certain things obviously today we've talked about a, uh, this presentation is a general presentation, kind of an introductory presentation uh, for people in, in relation to the ALN Act. And uh, there are other factors such as, um, you know, how to support a child, a young person who may not have capacity or certainly a young person without capacity in making this decision uh, and supporting them through appeal if need be as well. So the, the Act actually deals with that quite specifically. We haven't talked about it here because we thought it might be a bit too long and a bit overwhelming to deal with that as well. Um, but certainly the Act does cover it, which I think is very helpful. And I agree with both of you that, you know, it, it is it is a really tough balancing act. I think it's good that it's in the act that a young person needs must be considered. But I agree with you, Mike, that there is a real concern that if a, a young person, perhaps because of their needs um, or perhaps because they're just at a stage of life where perhaps they really don't want to feel different. We do get that a lot as well. You know, people don't want to feel different, um, you know, maybe declining an IDP and and then, of course, nobody able to compel them even though it might be a unified agreement between parents, professionals, teachers, et cetera, that it's right for them. Obviously, people do. Well, people with capacity have the right to make an unwise decision under the Mental Capacity Act. So, of course, this could very well fall within such a category. So it'd be interesting to see how that's in practice. Um, hopefully, it will prompt better education of young people, you know, where there's coming around, better support of young people to make informed choices. And I think that's really the intention of the Act, and I think that's to be lauded. But yes, absolutely, I think there is there's certainly a risk there. And I'm going to preempt your NHS question, Charlotte, as well, because I saw I saw that smile come across when you mentioned it earlier. So uh, again, that is something we haven't specifically addressed in this seminar, but there is a specific section or specific sections, I should say, regarding the involvement of NHS bodies and local health boards in the decision regarding uh, ALN. Uh, these are sections 20 and 21, for those of you at home taking notes. And they require, uh, or what they essentially empower, um, local authorities and those at mainstream schools to actually refer on to a local health board or NHS uh, body um, the question as to whether they might be able to offer a person who might have ALN those services. It's a little bit of a wishy-washy duty, I must say, uh, which is one of the reasons why I felt it didn't need to be included in the basic introduction of the Act. Um, but it does allow them to do so. And where such a referral is made, uh, then the health boards are required to to essentially come to a decision, and if it does identify treatment, then it must secure that. And of course, but, but, that's but Chris, why it would be in um, plan. Chris, one of the beauties of this, though, I mean, one of, this is one of the good things, is that we can say, can't we? And those who viewers who are watching this in England, for example, might often confront arguments whereby. Um, they the councils try and compartmentalize difficulties into different sections education, social care, health. Isn't this sort of a more wider, more general acknowledgement that one has to look at a child more holistically? Yes, I think there are certainly good things to it. I think, I suppose, as, as any um, you know, lawyer for children, young people, they want more cast iron duties on public bodies. Of course we would. And I'm sure our colleagues who are public body lawyers would like far more vague uh, duties as well. I suppose that I'm looking at it very much from the lens of, you know, I want greater clarity and greater responsibility uh, on those public bodies. Um, but yes, I think it is good that it's in there. It's improving the, the breadth of the coverage, certainly under the Education Act, making it more akin to that in in England, but equally as you say, Mike, perhaps giving that broader scope as as a way to to just get more provision for children, young people. So yes, I think I think it's good. I just think it could be better, but perhaps I'm being too demanding. Charlotte, I'm going to look to you on this because I, I know that you are uh, you're you're with me on this about my concern about um, uh, about the potential conflict between schools and parents. Mm. Interesting from what you said in your presentation, 
just a couple of points, really. One is, it's rather ironic that you have a situation in which a school might say, well, this young person's needs are too complex, so we ask the local authority to help. Uh, and the decision is then made to send it back to the local authority, to the school, to actually maintain, mm. draw up and then maintain the plan. I mean, there's one point that is of concern to me, but that's not the end game, isn't it? We all know that the drawing up of a plan is not the end stage. A plan is a living instrument. Um, and once a plan is then maintained by the school, you know, from day one, a child, let's say, who's very complex, does that just eradicate the idea that that child is no longer comp so complex that you don't have to try and be really careful about uh, about how you uh, tweak the plan in the future at every annual review? Do you, are you going to require that expertise uh, you know, time and time again. Um, so how many plans are going to let be left in a state um, that we often see, well, we've seen right across, whether you we have a part of the UK you might live, we know you have a, a statement or plan drawn up from um, when a child's five and it doesn't really change much when they're 12. Um, so, so the monitoring of the plan uh, in the future is going to require that level of expertise. And it seems to me that the, and whether you agree with me, but this, this entire shift from the concept of making sure the assessment is thorough and the fact that we are going to come on to this, I know in the next section of the presentation over what you can appeal against, but to the idea of a watcher going to the actual plan itself, the, all we're doing is shifting the emphasis from you draw, everyone gets a plan if you qualify for additional learning uh, provision, if you, you're likely to, if, it's if what you need is additional to or different from the provision that's typically available in, in mainstream schools or colleges in Wales. But to, to the shift is going to be onto the drafting of the plan itself and what should actually be the, 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 the detail of that plan, the, the, the flesh to the bones, if you like. Um, and the idea that you can do that without recognizing the critical importance that should be played on getting proper expert opinion causes me concern. Uh, it has always caused me concern, because not least due to the fact that from practicing this subject as long as I have, even in England, where the code of practice is quite specific, as is the regulations about what advice you should obtain when you're drawing up before you draw up a plan, leaving it vague and discretionary about what expertise you should call for makes me very concerned. Uh, and I think that those clients that come to us as experts, we know what needs to be put into plans because we have the experience, will probably get good plans. But what about the many thousands of young people who don't have that expertise and rely solely on the advice and opinions of a school? that might see it not necessary to get that level of expertise, not only at day one, but throughout the child's uh, course at school. That is a matter of concern. Um, and, I, and I also think, uh, whether you agree with me on this, Charlotte, because I'm talking a lot here, but I also concerned about the point that Chris made earlier when he responded to my point, very respectfully disagreeing with me, about the feud between the parents and the, and, and, and the, the, the school. The idea really is, what I don't like about this legislation, uh, and um, I, it caught, fills me with fear, I hope, I share Chris's optimism, I want to be optimistic, I, of course, I, I, I live in hope that, that, that things will not be bad and things will go really well, but I am concerned that schools are being on the front line here, time and time again, not only in the decision, but in the maintenance of the plan, the questions about whether the school then is complying with it, the questions about enforcing change to the plan and the idea about whether or not you know at annual reviews whether or not it's actually a, properly being treated as the living instrument that it is i think is putting parents and schools too much at loggerheads together or at least potentially i hope not but potentially that's what my concern is so to, to elaborate on the point that i was making to chris earlier to you it, these are the points as we go drill through the legislation you start seeing the exposure of schools to legal, potential legal challenges, and that fills me with dread. I can certainly see that. So I, I'm going to change tack to Charlotte. I, I know we didn't put it in the slides uh, so far, but uh, in terms of placement, so so you read out there, obviously, that the placement boarding or lodging is to be in there. 
But under section 14.6, um, and, and this is where local authorities are preparing a plan, a similar uh, provision exists for those. Um, no, it is actually at the local authority level, uh, where it essentially says that if the reasonable needs of a child or young person for additional learning provision cannot be met, unless the local authority also secures provision of the kind in subsection six, which is a place at a particular school or institution, board and lodging, the authority must include a description. So we see a shift of emphasis there because it's saying uh, if the child or young person's reasonable needs cannot be met unless you name a particular placement or cannot be met unless you name board or lodging, um, then you must include it. But that seems to suggest that as long as the needs kind of may be met, or you're not certain that they cannot be met without naming a particular institution, you don't ha have actually have to specify a placement at all. So that seems to be quite a shift from where we are currently with statements and EHCPs where you, you must have a placement. So what are your thoughts on that point? Do you think there's a, an area of concern there? Well, I think that you, you, you do have to name a placement it's interesting, isn't it? You do have to name a placement in in a school because we know that the we know that the code of practice um, mm. that the code of practice says that the IDP has to has to include information about the place at the name school. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very interesting if we end up with a decision that says that under this statutory regime you don't need to name a place in the in the um, IDP at all. I, um, yeah. I think that would be bizarre to say the least. Yeah, it's it's interesting. What we're what we're really looking at is a situation where there remains a dividing line between ALP that a school or institution can offer and ALP that only the local authority can offer. And so I think what's going to happen in practice is where the governing body is maintaining the um is, is maintaining the IDP, um, the IDP is just going to name that school, isn't it? Yeah, of course, because yeah. by definition, if that school says, well, we just can't meet need. Yeah, then it has to go to the local authority. Yeah. yeah, then it would have to go to the local authority. So I think probably a lot of these things will kind of pragmatically come out in the wash, but I can definitely see scope for some interesting challenges here. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting the way it was drafted. Um, the, the good news is that Section 9 of the Education Act 1996 is not amended by this. It will still exist. So parents can still express a preference for a school and the duty under Section 9 to, to name or to consider to name uh, that placement uh, in accordance with wishes still apply. So that's good. So that's not changed. But there's no longer that specific naming or that duty to name like we see in Section 39 of the Children and Families Act. So, yeah, I'm hopeful for you as well. I think that's what we're talking about is it because it, it's coming into force later uh, in this year in September. You know, we we don't quite know yet how this is going to be implemented on the ground. And a lot of these issues and concerns we raise can be avoided with good pragmatic implementation. And so let's hope Let's hope that we get it. So, uh, so Charlotte, you know, let's say we do have a plan that we don't like um, at the school or local authority level. So can you tell us a bit about what parents might be able to do there? Yes. So let's have a look at reconsideration and appeal, which is part six of, um, of our seminar. So um, firstly, um, under Section 26 of the Act, if a governing body of a maintained school has made a decision about a pupil's additional learning needs, whatever that decision is, or if they just refuse to make a decision about it, and the child or the child's parents, or if we're talking about a young person, the young person, ask the local authority to reconsider that decision, or a governing body of a maintained school um, maintains an IDP for the registered pupil, and the child, the child's parents or a young person asked the local authority to reconsider the plan with a view to it being revised. So firstly, if a governing body effectively decides that the pupil doesn't have ALN or, or refuses to make a decision one way or the other, or secondly, the governing body is maintaining an IDP and the child or the child's parents or the young person is dissatisfied with the content of the plan, in either of those events, they can ask the local authority to reconsider the plan um, or, or reconsider the decision. And the local authority then has seven weeks in which to reconsider that decision unless the following exceptions apply. So firstly, the local authority does not have to do a reconsideration if it has previously reconsidered the IDP 
and it is satisfied that the people's needs have not really changed since that decision and there's no, no new information that would really affect it. Or secondly, the, requ the request relates to a child who has become looked after by a local authority, um, except if that child is in the area of a local authority in England. Or thirdly, the pupil has become subject to a detention order. Now, reconsideration, as we note on this slide, is the only right, I mean, we say appeal, it's really the only, the only way to reconsider directly or to challenge directly a school governing body's decision, because the appeal rights in relation to the tribunal only relate to the decisions of local authorities and, and um, further education colleges. But there is, so, so that's the first step, if you like, under section 26, um, you, can, you can ask if you are dissatisfied with the decision that's made in respect of your child's um, needs or your needs if you're a young person, or if you're dissatisfied with the IDP that is currently being maintained for your child or for yourself, um, then you can ask the local authority to reconsider that decision. Um, going on to point six point two, what happens when the local authority decides? Uh, what what happens when the local authority is considering taking over the plan? Well, under section twenty eight of the Act, if the governing body or the FE College is main, is maintaining an IDP for a child or a young person, and if the child or young person asks the local authority to consider taking over responsibility for maintaining the plan, then the LA must make that decision unless either the local authority has previously made a decision under the same section in relation to the same child or young person and is satisfied that nothing has materially changed since last time and there is no new information that would affect the decision or the child is, uh, has become looked after. Um, those are the exceptions to the duty. If the local authority decides to take over responsibility for maintaining the plan, then it will be treated as the plan will be treated as being maintained by the local authority. So you don't have to kind of make a new IDP. It effectively transfers to the to the local authority's control. And secondly, from the date of the um, local authority's notification of the decision, the governing body will no longer be required to maintain that plan. Going on to 6.3, we've talked briefly about rights to the um, Education Tribunal for, uh, of Appeals, the Educational Tribunal for Wales. So what can you appeal? Well, firstly, you can appeal a decision by the governing body of um, an institution in the further education sector, so an FE college under Section 11, or a local authority's decision under Sections 13, 18 or 26 as to whether a person has additional learning needs. So it's important to bear in mind that you do have a right of appeal in respect of a local authority's refusal to reconsider those decisions that we were talking about in the earlier slide. Secondly, um, you can appeal, uh, if you are a young person, a decision by a local authority under Section 14 1C as to whether it is necessary to prepare and maintain an IDP. You can appeal the description of a person's ALN in an IDP. You can appeal the, addition, the, the, the additional learning provision, the ALP in an IDP, or the fact that ALP is not in a plan, including where the plan specifies that additional learning provision should be provided in, in Welsh. Um, you can appeal against the provision included in an, ID plan, uh, in an IDP under Section 14 or Section 19, or the fact that provision under those sections is not in the plan. You can appeal the school named in an IDP for the purpose of Section 48 of the plan. You can uh, appeal the fact that there is no school named in an IDP. Uh, you can appeal a decision under Section 27, as we were just looking at, not to revise an IDP. You can appeal a, a decision under Section 28 not to take over responsibility for an IDP from uh, a, a governing body. You can appeal a decision to cease to maintain an IDP. Uh, you can appeal a decision under Section 32 that a governing body should cease to maintain a plan. And you can appeal a refusal to decide a matter um, on the basis that the exceptions that we've looked at in Sections 11, Section 13, Section 18 and Section 29 apply. In other words, you can appeal the finding of a local authority that they are not going to review or consider um, a particular issue because they think that there's been no material change in needs and no new information that materially affects the decision. Uh, and the appeal must be issued along with a case statement. So you have to say why you're appealing within eight weeks of the decision appeals. Uh, going on to part 6.4, what can the tribunal do once you have appealed? So once the tribunal has determined your appeal, what can it do? Well, firstly, regrettably, it can dismiss the appeal. 
if it considers that the appeal wasn't properly made out, there wasn't enough evidence to support it. Secondly, the um, tribunal can order that a person does have or doesn't have ALN of a kind specified in the order. So in other words, the tribunal can make a decision about ALN and it can record that in an order. Thirdly, the tribunal can order a school, uh, uh, an, FE, uh, an FE college's governing body or a local authority to prepare an IDP. Um, it can also make that order uh, in relation to um, revisions to an IDP. So it can order an FE college or a local authority to revise an IDP as it specifies in its order. Uh, it can order the governing body of a maintained school in Wales or an institution in the further education sector in Wales or the local authority to continue to maintain an IDP with or without revisions. So that's in respect of a cease to maintain. It can order a local authority to take over responsibility for maintaining an, indivi a, a, an individual development plan. Uh, it can order the governing body of an FE college or a local authority to review an IDP and it can remit the case to the governing body of an FE college or a local authority for it to reconsider whether, having regard to observations made by the tribunal, it is necessary for a different decision to be made or a different action to be taken. And that's obviously quite an interesting addition to the powers that the Welsh Tribunal has, as opposed to, for example, the English Tribunal. So those are the... Um, rights of reconsideration and the rights of appeal. That was quite a technical canter through, and I do apologise for that, but it's quite difficult not to look at that technically because it's all about mechanisms for appeal and where they arise. So I'm really interested, Mike, um, as a long-standing expert in this field, what do you think of the way that the Act is restructuring rights of appeal? Well, it's interesting. Um, I mean, pretty much. It's, it's giving another step in the process, isn't it, whereby all the key decisions ultimately that are likely to end up with a challenge uh, are going to have to be made by the local authority because they have to make the decision whether to inherit the plan and so on. Um, so I think that um, in terms of one of the big concerns that I have is in practice, where is it going to leave a child who, let us, let us say, has special educational needs requiring um, a package of speech therapy one hour two hour a week or whatever and who then says uh, they're not getting it um, is it going to result in in practice uh, those parents not having uh, a right of appeal to the court in judicial review because there's this mechanism whereby the local authority could uh, be challenged uh, about it taking over responsibility, either taking over or not taking over responsibility of the plan. So that that interests me, uh, or at least um, I, I'm not sure whether or not you agree with me on that, Charlotte, but that's one of the key points for me that um, that, that sticks out, namely that there's this another sort of um, vehicle or process that a, a parent would have to go down before going to the sort of immediate result that you much more immediate anyway than uh, by applying for injunctive relief in an emergency in the high court what do you think of that i think that's right i suppose that in theory if what you were if, if the dispute between you and the school teaching your child was you were saying that the school could reasonably be expected to provide something without recourse to the local authority and the school saying no we can't I suppose potentially you could then judicially review the school on the basis of well the plan that the, the act the act doesn't really provide for that you know in a straightforward where the school's saying we don't need anything else from the local authority but we're not going to provide what you're asking for and you're saying but it's reasonable to expect you to provide that we agree you don't need to go to the local authority but it's reasonable to expect you as a school to provide that that's the sort of situation where I think you could JR under this because there's no remedy for that situation. But I agree with you, Mike, the pressure really in that situation would be for the parents to turn to the local authority, wouldn't it? Yeah, and you see, and, and the trouble with that with that is that you're right, there's no remedy. Um, but you, you know, Charlotte, as well as I, in practice, a court looking at this will say, well, why didn't you ask the local authority to inherit this? If, the, the, very, the key point, which is that this speech therapy, for example, in my scenario, is not being uh, delivered. Um, therefore, Clearly, you can demonstrate the very good reason why, because this school can't deliver it, why the local authority should inherit it, because they are the one who is empowered and have the financial resources to deliver it. 
and therefore go down there. Don't, don't trouble the, the administrative court. That's what I'm thinking in practice. That's the kind of responses I think we're going to get. And then young people, there's two things that emerge from that. One is my point, which I've been laboring on all, all day today, that you're again maintaining this feud between the parents and the school. That's the one thing. But more importantly than that, the child is going to be delayed in getting that support. And that's what I see, foresee as an area of concern that I've always had from day one, from the, when this was even at Bill's stage. Chris, those are my points. Do you agree with that? Well, you know, it's going to be really interesting, isn't it? I think, I think there are a number of good points in this act that I think do help when we talk about rights of, of appeal. Um, you know, firstly, when we talk about, as we did earlier, about the fact that there is a duty to decide whether a, a child or young person has ALN, I think it's very good that not only do they only have limited statutory grounds on which to refuse that, and those statutory grounds are essentially that we've made this decision recently and nothing has changed, but you also going to get the right to appeal that decision to the to the tribunal as well. So it, it limits... Um, institutional and local authority abilities to kind of step out of responsibility for deciding whether a child or young person has ALN, but still gives the right to appeal there um, and gives a lot of various, uh, you know, rights of appeal. And I, I think, Mike, you know, talking about, as you say, the point you've talked about much today is that that tension between schools and parents and that tension between institutions and parents. I mean, I think there is some sympathy I have with with colleges here. Because, of course, they don't have the shield of the local authority, you know, to take them through. They will be uh, defending themselves at tribunal. Um, and that's something, obviously, that they've never had to do before. You know, if, if it, well, I mean, it hasn't been possible for a college to go before a tribunal here in Wales before because it was dealt with under a different act, as we discussed at the start. Um, but certainly in England, where you can have FE colleges named as placements, you know, they can come as witnesses, but they're not your opponent. The local authority is always your opponent. Um, and I think it really will be tough for them to to manage appeals, I think, because it's a it's a totally different ball game for them. And then if they feel, well, we need, you know, legal advice and support to do this, which you can understand, given that unlike the local authority that will have education officers and staff who will probably be trained to represent the local authority at that level and of course will have its own legal team if it really needs uh, you know a solicitor or possibly even a barrister to represent them you know for colleges you know who's going to fund that legal advice as well it's going to be a, a, a real minefield out there I think for FE colleges and uh, you know though of course you know as a children's rights lawyer my my side is always with the children and young people um, I have some sympathy. I have some sympathy for them, I must say. Well, Chris, it's funny because I've never really seen um, schools and colleges being in a different, different camp to children. Um, yeah. My main reason is that I, I've always seen them as partners. Um, and this is the whole point that I was making from day, from the very moment, <laughs> you know, when this bill was created, that this is my concern. The idea that we, there's, there's going to be a crash course needed for the, for the further education sector, exposure that the further education sector we haven't really gone into that in great detail in this presentation, but exposure to the to the um, uh, to, to 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 challenges uh, by young people, um, and I have enormous sympathy for schools. I always have, uh, and I still do. That um, I think this legislation is placing a great expectation on them. Uh, which brings us, of course, on to the question of implementation. So who's going to talk about the implementation? Chris, given that you've been, you are the author of these slides, maybe you want to talk about the implementation of the, of the act. That's right. And everyone blame me if you, if you think they're rubbish. Uh, no, that's right. So Absolutely, if... yes. We, <laughs> don't forget, we got, we got a disclaimer at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please send uh, complaints to Christopher McFarland. So, no, so you're quite right. So looking at implementation, so for those of you at home who have been following the ALN Act across its long, long history, I mean, it has been through consultations, even before it was called the ALN Act um, and the ALN Bill, as it was prior to that, you know, it's gone through many, many different uh, revisions and a very long history. So turning to implementation, we have a slide for this again. And uh, it was intended to be implemented last year in September 2020. And ironically, before the pandemic, it was decided that more time is needed to do that, to implement the various processes needed for it. 
and it was postponed until September this year. Then, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has happened and that has also changed. So there was a very detailed consultation and implementation document put forward. And that was setting out the strategies that would be in place. But that's now been superseded uh, by a statement issued by the Welsh Government in February 2021. But that statement from February 2021, at the time of recording, has now been superseded again by a new statement from the new Minister for Education in July 2021. So we've added this to the slide. And it explains that uh, following the previous statement uh, on the 2nd of February, uh, the Welsh Government has decided, due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, that they should change the implementation of the bill uh, further to ensure that it can be rolled out smoothly. And they've now split the way it's going to be implemented in the first year. Uh, so this means for those children who are or are newly identified as having additional learning needs, uh, that is those without already identified special educational needs, or not awaiting an undergoing SEN assessment, will still move to the new ALN system from the 1st of September 2021. However, for those children who attend maintain school, including a pupil referral unit, and who have already identified SEN via School Action or School Action Plus, the new system will apply from the 1st of January 2022 instead. So this is a shift of position from the February implementation, which had planned to implement the Act for those on School Action, School Action Plus straight away, and then to delay the implementation for those with a statement. Now, what will the impact of this be on those pupils? Well, there will be a delay, as we've talked about, from a planned rollout to those with statements. And of course, for that, we weren't too concerned because statements will stay in force. They will still be statutorily enforceable documents. So, of course, for those pupils, unless something is already wrong and action should already be taken to resolve that now, uh, if things are still going well, then you have nothing to fear because that will stay in place until the new act rolls in and until their plan is changed from a statement to an individual development plan. Uh, but it does now have some complexities for those on School Action, School Action Plus, in that they won't be getting their individual development plans in the first term of next year. It will move into the second year. However, once again, if things are already working well into School Action Plus, it's important to recognise that those actual systems on the ground shouldn't change. So if your child is receiving support under School Action Plus and that is working, it will not be taken away. It will just take a little bit longer to be formalised into a plan. If you are one of those parents of pupils or a young person yourself who is dissatisfied with the support you're getting under School Action Plus, then again, you can request that there be a decision made about your additional learning needs. And of course, then you can take further action to try and improve the quality of support you're getting. So there are still options to take. And I think although this is a disappointment, particularly given the long lead in uh, to the act that we've had, and obviously the postponement from last year to this year for implementation. Uh, I think the fact that it's only around three months, just over three months of further time, and it will occur in January of this year during the school year, and this is only for those pupils who are already receiving special educational provision, I think makes it a fairly reasonable extension in light of the pandemic. But I have to say it is it is definitely a disappointment. Well, I think that neatly leads us on to a bit of bit of a discussion of our thoughts on the Act. So we've gone through in detail, I suppose, or summarised detail as best as I can explain it, uh, the various sections of the Act. So uh, we now need to discuss it. Oh, so I will start with some positives because I think it's important to focus on the positives. So as we talked about earlier, the coverage of special educational provision as it currently is and uh, additional learning provision as it will be, uh, has extended significantly. Uh, to those children, young people in Wales. So firstly, it goes up to 25 rather than 19, as it currently ends. Uh, it goes into further educational college, which it currently doesn't with the same level of scope that it does for those not in further educational college. Uh, it also includes those pupils who historically would not have received a statement and also those in England who wouldn't receive an education healthcare plan. So the coverage of the Act is far broader than 
than the current legislation and the legislation in England, which means a lot more children and young people will have enforceable rights under statutory documents, which I think is very much a good thing. And of course, they will last through different and longer stage of education, so inc incorporating further educational colleges and up to the age of 25. So I think for me, those are definitely the positives, of course, alongside uh, the duty to decide. So meaning that you'll no longer make a request, wait six weeks and be told, no, we're not even going to assess. You now actually have a, a decision being made about whether or not you have an ALN. And of course, consequently, if you do have ALN, a plan must be provided. So I think there is certainly a bit of streamlining and a bit of certainty there in the process. But uh, but Charlotte, I mean, what are your thoughts on the Act, you know, having uh, practised uh, substantially in England, also with some Welsh cases, but uh, what are your views? Um, it's a very mixed bag. I, I can see I can see lots of lots of potential improvements, certainly in terms of I mean, there, there has been a pretty gross disparity between the scope for what I am now old fashionedly going to call special educational provision in Wales, as opposed to the situation across the border. And that has been that has been a source of constant, I think, frustration and distress to, to parents of Welsh children with special educational needs and rightly so. And I do think that the extension of the regime to 25, as you say, the the end of those, you know, the end of those sort of very complex cases, um, potentially the end of the troublesome policy in relation to just how much further education you can expect the Welsh government to fund. Um, all of that for, for, for young people who've got the potential to succeed on um, further education courses, the the. The clarification of all of that and the bringing of all of that within one regime with a clear endpoint of 25, I think is really positive. Um, in terms of in terms of all children with additional learning needs being entitled to an IDP, I think that's a positive development as well. I do find it unwieldy that you have some children with AL with, with, with ALN who don't have plans and are kind of reliant on informal arrangements within schools, which was the case under the Education Act and is still the case under the Children and Families Act. That that kind of two-tier system isn't desperately helpful. I think it's helpful to just say there will be a plan. I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing that schools supervise plans for some children. I think that the the difficulty is going to come when you're talking about those children who really are not going to be able to manage just on the ALP that schools provide. Because at that point, it really is going to vary quite drastically depending on how clued up the school is about um, ALN and how motivated the school is in terms of ensuring that children who are not cut, spotting children who aren't coping and making sure that they end up with plans that are overseen by the local authority. So, you know, I think the proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating, as always. I, I can see some bumps ahead, but I can also see calls for real optimism. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely uh, a good thing. Do you know what the trouble with this is? You know, you said all the good things, you leave all the bad things to me. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, I'm just like the, the Black Death. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I agree with everything you say. I mean, there's lots to 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 welcome um about the 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 um the, this new legislation i mean there, there, there really is i mean not least the fact one thing what really frustrated me is that it's been nearly 10 years since people in england have been able to appeal the the an annual review for example of what should go into the plan and goodness me why it's been so long in wales for those people to be able to do that is is, is beyond me frankly um, I also think it's extraordinary that we've had to wait two years for this legislation to come in uh, when it's been on the is is it, it, when it's been fully passed. I mean, it's disappointing that is. I'm just giving all bad bad things really, um, but um, but overall, uh, the the legislation I think does does give a uh, a, um, a a process a procedure that's now open to many people to do something about it when things go wrong. I think the in a nutshell, I'd say that the focus of attention is merely shifting from what was traditionally uh, an analysis of the quality of one's assessment to the quality of one's plan. Um, that's all that's really happened by the removal of the need to appeal uh, the, the contents of, um, of whether there's a decision with whether or not someone uh, should be assessed. If everyone gets a plan, the emphasis is going to be on the the quality of the plan. Simple as that, and that's going to flag up all the same things that we we now at this point in time argue about in the assessment. 
So I, I'm not so sure if that's such a wonderful thing, really. Particularly, it's not so wonderful if you get uh, a load of very substandard plans. That's not going to be helpful to anyone. Um, and uh, I take on board the point that Chris made at the uh, at the outset about the whether or not there's going to be this legal requirement for the same degree of specificity that exists traditionally in law up to now, both in, in England and Wales, whether that's going to be finding its way um, into the tribunal system and whether we're going to get plans which are going to be much more vague, not least due to the fact that the duty to maintain them is going to be upon the school and we come back to the judicial viewpoint that I made earlier. So I'm not really sure overall. I, I, a cautious optimism, I guess, uh, about it. Uh, but I think probably if, I ha- if, if this was on a weighing scales, I'd be more cautious than I am optimistic, sadly. Um, because in practice, I think um, years, 30 years of doing this has made me pretty uh, Jaded. pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm certainly cynical. Um, so, I mean, in terms, of the, in, in terms of the way forward, though, generally, I do like the fact that at last, at long last, young people are not having to debate their case, their learning and skills plan through the Welsh Assembly government processes. We've got a vehicle to debate that. Um, I think that in practice, we're going to see delay. And so the headline word that I think will um, will haunt Wales from here on is delay. And I don't mean delay in deciding the plan. I mean delay in deciding the critical provision to meet that plan, to meet those needs. I think, uh, and then even if it's a, it, it, there's going to be a delay in relation to, to, to quantifying it, to specifying it, and I think there will be a delay in the implementation of it. That's my that's my take. If I had a crystal ball, that's what I think the headline uh, word is going to be. Charlotte, that brings us to some practical guidance. Um, we've got some practical guidance that uh, have been issued on our slides. Um, and um, have you got any thoughts about that? The practical guidance. I think it's I think it's very very sensible. I mean, there's going to be there's going to be a transition. It is going to be well. I, Realistically speaking, you're quite right. It's going to be delayed. If you look at what happened in England when the Children and Families Act came in, it took it took years for everybody who was on a statement to be moved over to an EHC plan. Um, it, it, it took much longer than people expected, and there were various target dates for everybody to be moved over, which were missed and missed and missed, as I'm sure we all remember. Um, and so I think in the meantime, pragmatism is the way forward. So I think absolutely, yes, if it's if it's not broken, don't fix it. If what you've got at the moment is working, let it continue. Let it continue. Let your school or, or college or local authority come to you in their own time and organise the transition. Because if you force it, there is a real risk that you will end up with something that doesn't work as well as what you've got now. If it's not working well, then you need to address that. And you would need to address that whether we were in the middle of this statutory transition or not. And I think it's right that a new assessment is always going to benefit a child or young person if things are not working out for them, it's really, really important to understand why and to update that provision. And you can add that to your IDP or you can add that to, um, you know, you could add that to a current statement, I suppose. Um, If the young person is turning 19, that's the big one, isn't it? Because if the young person is turning 19, that's where this statutory regime makes a real difference for them. Um, and I think I think I would agree with the advice here because it, it, it would make sense for young people to be prioritised in terms of transfer because they will be young people who either don't have any kind of existing plan or whatever plan they do have will be coming to an end for them under the current regime. So if you are um, if, you, if you haven't had confirmation of this from wherever your young person is being educated or whoever is responsible for their uh, for their plan, then as it says here, once the Act is fully implemented, you should request an assessment. And I think, Mike, we say that, don't we? Because, again, we don't really want to rush an assessment that is not properly thought out and causes more problems than it than it, than it solves. Yeah, I mean, Charlotte, you probably know as well as I. I mean, I was, I was looking at an education healthcare plan the other day. <laughs> it was extraordinary because that was rushed. Um, but all the provision was set out in outcomes. Uh, there was and there was nothing much left in the section F. It was yeah. all under the outcome side. So, yeah. so really, we're seeing. I I do. The other thing I was going to say is that I think practically and a good thing is that we've got a much more uh, a concrete system. We've got one plan that um, and that the, the Welsh government has 
suggested in the, in the code of practice that must be followed by all. I, I, I think I agree with that because we saw chaos uh, in, two, in 2014 when the Children and Families Act came about. So I think that um, but rushing things doesn't give you much, much benefit. Chris, any other thoughts? No, absolutely right. I think I think you're quite right there. I think one of the things that I was slightly surprised at, and of course, in preparing the slides, obviously, we were anticipating that there would be more of a focus on those turning 19. And I suppose when you look now at the, at the implementation plan that we looked at earlier, they're actually not specifically referred to. So I think it's quite good that we've, we've advised people here to be a bit more proactive, because of course, you know, when you're coming to the end of your your school time and you're transitioning to uh, college, you know, certainly if you've had a statement uh, up until the end of your education, you're still going to need uh, one of these plans, you know, once you go there. So it's good to be a bit more proactive. I think those are the people who probably should have the most vigilance uh, in terms of transitioning over because this statement can't go with them, you know, if they if they reach the end of the, the school year in which they turn 19, the statement will lapse. Likewise, if they go to an FE college, the statement will lapse. So for those um, young people, it's it's important that they are quite vigilant. For everyone else, as you say, you can make the judgment call. If you're happy with your statement, uh, then then definitely, you know, wait and, and wait for good time for it for it to come along. And I think that's that's really helpful. So so yes, I mean, as ever, it will remain to be seen, and it will take some time for people to be uh, transferred over. But I think, you know, I think like with the Children and Families Act, there will always be some teething problems that perhaps we couldn't anticipate at this stage. But I think now when we look back at the Children and Families Act, because it's seven years now, but I think it's been this way for a couple of years, it did settle down quite quickly and I think worked quite effectively quite quickly. So I'm hopeful that uh, that this act will remain the same. Well, it's interesting that, Chris. I mean, you, you, you're right. When you talked about the implementation, that the young people at the age of 19 are not really mentioned. Um, is that perhaps to do with the fact that buried deep in the Welsh Government website is a series of uh, um, technical guidance issued to specialist colleges that appear to suggest that uh, once you have your two years post-schooling, um, then that is your lot. Uh, and I think that a lot should be gleaned from um, the implementation slide that you very kindly um, produced about that what we are actually seeing is that the Welsh Government's approach is to implement that, um, that's, that technical guidance uh, and that many young people at the age of 18, 19 might still go without under the current um, regime, um, but would probably practically, unless I'm mistaken, uh, be advised to try and get the IDP drawn up for them sooner rather than later. Um, Chris, what do you do? You agree with that? Yes, uh, I think just simply yes. I think that's a, it's always good to you know, it, as we we've been talking about, you you've always got to look at your your situation and whether you're going to be better off you know, having the plan or not. And certainly if there is uncertainty, you know, as we talked about earlier, if you're if you're lapsing out of the current system or if you're transitioning to a new system where historically you would lapse, then certainly I think it's worth your while requesting um, requesting the decision. And of course, you do have that right. So I think it's really important, as we talked about earlier with the implementation, that's how they're going to be rolling out. We all agreed it was pretty reasonable, the strategy and the people they were going to focus because they were generally at transitions. And they talked about at this stage um, that they aren't focusing on those in post-16 education for the first year of implementation for that more general rollout. But that does not prohibit people from requesting that decision and using those rights under the Act um, at any time they like, you know, they are rights and there are duties upon those institutions that will come from the 1st September. So it's always a personal decision to make, uh, but certainly if you if you have concerns, you feel there's uncertainty, then transitioning to a plan uh, as early as possible might be the right choice for you. So take advice if you need it, we're always here to help, um, but certainly make those decisions uh, that are in your best interest. And if you're a college out there, you, I'm sure you'll want to have a crash course. And, I'm sure. Uh, Charlotte's here. <laughs> 
Charlotte's here welcoming. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Charlotte, you're going to be up many nights well, giving colleges crash courses. You know that, don't you? Times, yeah. <laughs> you do you do realize sleep is not going to be part of your of your daily regime. Justice never sleeps, Mike. <laughs> Justice never sleeps. <laughs> it doesn't Brilliant. in my house anyway. <laughs> well, that brings me that brings me, um, I think, um, to the to the stage of the questions and answers. As of course, many of you have presented questions um for us as a panel to answer. So um uh, we're going to get to that phase now um, uh, of our presentation. So um, here is here are the questions. So our first question is about the nature of IDPs and reads, will an IDP assessed and issued by county have the same weight as a current statement? And will my son continue with his statement provision when all children or young people are switched to IDPs? Well, the answer to the first part of that question, yes. Uh, the whole purpose of an IDP, certainly at county level, is that it will work in exactly the same way as a statement. It will be um, managed and implemented by the local authority, and they will have an in, you will have an enforceable right against the authority to implement that provision. So very much the plan is to keep the status quo in terms of the strength of a plan versus a statement, uh, even if the format is slightly changing. And of course, the content of a statement uh, shouldn't necessarily change unless, of course, the, the child's needs have changed. So you shouldn't see a reduction in provision generally. Um, it should only be if the child's needs have changed since the statement was last written. Uh, so in terms of this uh, listener's son, I would like to think uh, that his statement provision will stay when he switched to an IDP. But of course, if there are any amendments uh, that you are unhappy with, you will have the opportunity to go to the tribunal as you would normally. But our anticipation is, and certainly in practice it was with the Children and Families Act, that actually because there was such a pressure on transitioning pupils to the new form of plan, uh, that actually a lot of a lot of statements were just transposed straight into education healthcare plans with, with very little amendment. So we think that'll generally be the case here, although of course there will be exceptions where changes are proposed. Some of those may be great and some of those may be welcome. Uh, some of those of course may be less welcome and some may need to be charged to tribunal. Uh, but until such time as he switched to cross, his statement will stay up, still in force. And when he is switched to cross, his provision will usually follow with him, less amended, and it will be enforceable after that as well. So no change anticipated. Our second question is from an expert in occupational therapist who says, my question is what impact the law changes will have on therapy provision? Currently, I'm contracted to provide therapy as an independent practitioner by local authorities when the local teams don't have capacity to do so. Is this likely to change? Well, from the side of the law and the side of the statement, no. You know, if uh, therapeutic provision is named uh, in an IDP, then it, it must be delivered as we just discussed. So that shouldn't change from the side of the law, nor should it change from the rights of the child. Obviously, in terms of the hiring practices of public bodies um, and health bodies, obviously that's something they will do internally. It's not governed by law itself but I see no reason why they would change as a result of, of the law shifting, because as we've just discussed, it is very much to keep the status quo that provision within a plan must be delivered and there is an enforceable right to it. So I wouldn't think there'd be any change. Uh, our third question is from a parent and it reads, my 10 year old boy is on School Action Plus and has been for at least two years. I'm in the process of requesting a statutory assessment as there is no way he will cope in a mainstream comprehensive school. With the announced delay for IDPs for School Action, School Action Plus children, where will this leave my boy? So this is perhaps one of the direct consequences we've seen from the new uh, transitional uh, statement made by the Welsh Government in July, which is now pushed off those pupils who were on School Action, School Action Plus, and were due to transfer pretty much straight away in September off to January 2022. Now, in this particular case, because a statutory assessment has already been requested or will shortly be requested, then that process will continue under the current system until its end, uh, subject to the local authority agreeing to undertake an assessment. Now, the findings of that assessment will likely have been received by the time the Act is already in place. So you may find that instead of offering a statement, they'll use the findings of that assessment to transfer to an IDP because the findings for special educational needs and additional learning needs are very much the same. So in this particular case, 
uh, that should be the next step there if this assessment's been concluded. But of course, for those who are on School Action, School Action Plus, you know, firstly, much like those with statements, if things are working well, you don't need to worry. Carry on with School Action and School Action Plus until it's transitioned over to the new format. Uh, even if it's moved to the new format, that doesn't mean you need to get any more or any less provision. It's only important that the provision is right for that child. So if it's working, it doesn't need to change. Uh, and if it isn't working, then it's absolutely important that you're already taking those steps to open dialogues with the school or with the local authority, like this parent has here, to try and get things changed. So for the child in this case, either through the statutory assessment or very early in the next year, through a request to the school, the change can be made earlier. Again, it's important to recognise that the rollout is scheduled um, to take place for you know on an ongoing basis. So it's how the schools and the local authority are going to start transitioning people of their own volition, but the rights to request a decision, the rights to request a plan, those will still exist from the 1st of September. And for our final question, we have another uh, parent question, which says, with all the delays, what happens to those about to go into years 11 and 13? Both statement it, one leaving to go to college rather than sixth form, one going to do foundation diploma prior to uni. So if these two boys were staying in school-based education, then actually nothing at all. Their statements would continue, as we've discussed during this uh, seminar. And of course, they would still be entitled to provision therein. But there's a bit of a twist in the tale with this one because they're both going to different institutions. So one is going to college. So colleges in Wales uh, are not subject to statements under the current law as exists. They move across to a learning and skills plan under the Learning and Skills Act. So the local authority would have been uh, under the Welsh ministers, I should say, would have been under an obligation uh, to start that process. It's normally undertaken through Careers Wales to create the learning and skills plan for college. So that should have taken place, although it wouldn't surprise me, given the pandemic and the legislative changes, if they didn't undertake that. So if they haven't undertaken that, that for the young man going to college, uh, the right step would be to go and uh, speak to the college straight away, notify them that he previously had a statement, confirm to them that you would like to have a plan, and move forward from there. Uh, at the college level, the college will be the first instance, uh, as it is with schools. But unlike schools, you don't have the right to challenge a college's finding to the local authority. You can, however, ask the local authority to take over the plan, as we've talked about before. And you could very well in these cases, particularly since both young people are statemented, look to do that, as often pupils with statements will have provision in their in their statements, there will be more than a college could deliver. So get in contact with the local authority, get in contact with the college and start that process as soon as possible uh, because your statement will not be able to go with you to college. Uh, for the second young person who's doing a foundation diploma, it's not clear where that is. Uh, if it's like college, like their sibling, then yes, absolutely. The same process for the first child could be followed for the second child. But if they're going to higher education, then neither the new or the current systems would follow with them. There are different uh, rights under the Equality Act for reasonable adjustments, both at the school level and university level, but they don't go as far as the provision you would find within a statement. It's more about providing some supplementary services. But there are grants for disabled students that are available at university, and often universities will have specific disability departments that you can contact that will help you apply for that funding to get the support you need. That could be equipment such as laptops or dictaphones, it could be additional tutors, it could be scribes, it could be all sorts, but it's actually tailored towards the needs of the individual. So if you're going to university, you won't get a statement and you won't get an individual development plan, but there are other means for you to get special educational provision at the university level. It will just be termed a different way. Well, there it is. The, um, the new law in Wales, we've gone through it and we've gone through it in some detail. We've answered some of your questions and I'm sure many of you will have many questions to ask. And of course, please do, because we are here to help you and drop us an email uh, at education at sinclairslaw.uk, .co.uk, I should say. 
Um, but thank you for, for, for watching our, our, our presentation. It's slightly different to the normal education magazine because normally the education magazine will have guests on and we'll talk um, interactively about different things, not so technical, really. Um, but of course, it's need, it was needed today because the law is fundamentally changing. So um, that kicks off our first edition of the education magazine. And of course, um, my again, my great thanks to, to Chris McFarland and to Charlotte for taking their time to, uh, to, to, to help everyone today. Um, thank you both so very much for, for your assistance. And, um, and I hope to see you again back in our new series of the Education Magazine, which will be starting again, hopefully in September. So uh, if you've got any points you want to, to make or any stories you want to share with us, please feel free to contact, to contact us and just dropping us an email, uh, education uh, at sinclairslaw.co.uk. We'd be very, very happy to perhaps look at that and decide whether or not it's something we want to talk about. Uh, and there is a lot of talk to talk about, of course, because uh, we're coming out of a pandemic at the moment, at least the time we're recording this. I hope we're not going to go back into it. But um, I think we are, we're, we're, we're looking more optimistically at our future now, and we've got a bit more liberty than we did have before. So uh, looking forward to seeing you all again uh, in, in September. Charlotte, thank you so much for your time. Um, um, grateful as always. It was a pleasure. And Chris, thank you. Um, hope to see you again in the magazine in September. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to coming back. And thanks to you all for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you again very soon.